Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the second part of our uh, two-part event. Uh, earlier on, we launched the book after the post-colonial Caribbean memory, imagination, hope, my book, and um, we had a really great discussion that followed from it. Um, <clears throat> and that discussion, in a, in a sense, segues into what we're doing here now, because um, I felt that precisely because the book <coughs> is entitled memory, is subtitled memory, imagination, hope, that we should have hope included here as well as imagination. Um, and so what we've done is extend the, the book launch into a panel that will <coughs> essentially be asked only one question and then left to their own devices to figure it out. And that one question is, really it's a double barrel question. What is the present state of the Caribbean and how do we envision the future of the region? So essentially, um, in a few minutes, I'm, I'm gonna repeat that and then um, I'll just indicate uh, who is here and how they will, an they will try to answer that. Question in three minutes um, <laughs> each. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they can expand beyond that. But we're not going to have any long-winded presentations here to start off with or any long-winded long presentations at all. But we're going to have a conversation which we will pick up in a few moments. But before I do, let me introduce our panel. Do we have our, um, our speakers who are coming in on Zoom? Okay. okay. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing myself, but not the Zoomers. Okay, um, okay. so le let me begin by introducing the people who are in-house, and then I'll go to our colleagues who are on the screen behind me. Um, beside me is Aaron Kamogisha, who was part of our very interesting pa um, discussion of the book earlier on, is the Ruth Simmons Professor of Africana Studies at Smith College. He's the author of Beyond Coloniality, Citizenship and Freedom in the Caribbean, um, and the, the editor of seven edited collections and six special issues of journals on Caribbean and Africana thought. Um, <coughs> next to him is Paget Henrys, Professor of Africana Studies and sociology at Brown. He's the author of Peripher Peripheral Capitalism and Underdevelopment in Antigua and Caliban's Reason, Introducing Afro-Caribbean Philosophy. Editor with Carl Stone of the New York Caribbean and with Paul Buell of CLR James's Caribbean and the editor of the CLR James Journal. Beside him is Daniel Rodriguez, is an associate, <coughs> associate professor of history at Brown University. He received his PhD from New York University in 2013. His work examines the social history of Latin America and the Caribbean with a focus on 19th and 20th century Cuba. His first book is The Right to Live in Health, Medical Politics in Postcolonial Havana, UNC Press 2020. Um, beside him and to the far left is Patsy Lewis, who is Senior Fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs and Director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Brown. Her most recent publications are Caribbean Regional Integration, A Critical Development Approach, Routledge 2022, and Caribbean Integration, Uncertainty in a Time of Global Fragmentation, co-edited with Terry Ann Gilbert Roberts and Jessica Byron, University of the West Indies Press 2022. Immediately behind me and above is Alyssa Trotz, who is, hi Alyssa, who is a professor of Caribbean studies at New College and the director of women and gender studies at the University of Toronto. She's affiliate faculty at the Dame Nita Barrow Institute of Gender Development Studies at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, Barbados. Her recent publications include 
The Point is to Change the World, Selected Writings by Andaye, 2020, which was published in Portuguese by Edition Funilaria in Brazil, forgive my Portuguese, and with Arif Bolkan, Unmasking the State, Politics, Economy, and Society in Guyana, 1992 to 2015, published in 2019. Um, Below her on my screen behind me is Francio Guadeloupe, who is an hi Francio, who is an associate hi. professor in anthropology at the University of Amsterdam. He's also a senior researcher at the Royal Netherlands Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies, KITLV. Guadeloupe is author of the monographs Chanting Down the New Jerusalem, Calypso Christianity and Capitalism in the Caribbean. You see University of California Press 2009, and Black Man in the Netherlands, an Afro-Antillian anth Anthropology, University of Mississippi Press 2022. <coughs> He's also editor of the Sage Journal Ethnography. And last but certainly not least, uh, hi Gabby, is Gabriel Hossein, a senior lecturer at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, Trinidad and Tobago. Gabrielle Hossein has been active in Caribbean feminist organizing for 25 years, and her blog, Diary of a, Mother, of a Mothering Worker, has been published as a weekly newspaper column since 2012. Her current areas of research are adolescent sexualities and Indo-Caribbean feminism. Ooh, a long list, uh, because we have a, a great list of leading Caribbean scholars with us today. And, um, I am going to uh, ask them in this first round, as I have asked them before on email, to limit their comments to three minutes uh, as best as possible. Um, if, they, if they go over it slightly, I won't cut them off, but I'm not allowing long-winded monologues in the first round. Uh, so. The question on the table is, and I will introduce you, so you, you don't, I mean, I will point you out so you don't need to just jump in at this stage. stage. Uh, before I ask the question, shall I say that when we have finished this first round of questions, then the floor of my colleagues up here and up there is open, so you can jump in when you wish. And before I start, I should recognize my members of my senior seminar class in Africana studies, many faces of whom are in front of me, and welcome, guys. And I should also men mention Patsy Lewis's class, which I imagine are over, at, you know, sticking together relentlessly over on this side of the room in uh, in her Caribbean um, course, and we're all over the place. Okay. Um, in her Caribbean course. Thanks for coming. Um, and of course, there was no arm twisting in this. They all came of their own free will, right? <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. Um, and so the question on the table is, how would you describe the present state of the Caribbean? And what kind of Caribbean do we envision for the, for the future? And I'm going to start with Aaron. Aaron I, I, I've been speaking a lot just now. I would like us to start with someone else. Okay, well, let's start with Paget, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> for me, the, to understand the present state uh, of the Caribbean, uh, I think it's in the grip of three basic forces. Uh, we've been immobilized by uh, the neoliberal uh, experiment, which has really paralyzed state governments uh, and policymakers in the region. Second, I think our intellectual uh, elites have been captured uh, by post-structuralism. And th this, to me, uh, is also a major, major stumbling block about seeing the way forward. <clears throat> there are problems with post-structuralism that I think make it uh, inappropriate for the Caribbean at this particular point in time. And I think uh, Brian's major, one of Brian's major interlocutors, David Scott, uh, 
doesn't quite see the limitations uh, of this discourse. And the way he articulates this concept of the tragic is a, I think the only way he's going to get past it is by seeing the way in which it is grounded uh, in post-structuralism. Uh, <clears throat> and then the third uh, thing that I think uh, accounts for the present state uh, of the Caribbean is uh, the, the leadership problems uh, of uh, the left when the left uh, either gets elected to office or they constitute a government so that there's a need to look at the Caribbean left in power. We have to learn from the mistakes that we made. We have to learn uh, all about the shortcomings of our ideas. They weren't perfect. And I think if we look carefully and objectively at those kinds of issues, then it just seems to me that the way forward uh, is both open and clear. <clears throat> That's it. Okay. okay, thank you, Paget. That's uh, very tight. Um, Danny um, Rodriguez. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I guess at the outset, I want to say, um, you know, pessimism is an important sort of sub-theme of the book and something that you're pushing back against. Um, and, I, and as I was reading it and thinking about talking about today, um, you know, in many ways, of course, like pessimism and even despair seem eminently warranted, right? Um, how do we, as a people, how do we as, as thinkers think, uh, grapple with the seeming quickening of reaction over the past year in the United States, the rapid collapse of reproductive rights here, um, growing attacks on queer and transgender people across the region, growing power, although not everywhere, of the democratic, undemocratic right? How do we come to terms with the growing certainty that we're hurtling towards ecological catastrophe with profound implications for the Caribbean in particular? You know, how much of our island masses will be underwater in 50 years? Um, how, how, how will ever stronger storms affect our infrastructure and economies? Um, how many of our people will continue to flee to wealthier nations? And these are questions I think about constantly. I mean, as a historian of Cuba with so many personal and familial ties to the island, I sometimes wonder whether there will be a Cuba by the time my daughter, who's 10 years old right now, grows old. Um, but fundamentally, and I think this gets to the book, I don't think we have, um, and I think we're in agreement here, we don't have the luxury of despair. And like Brian describes in the book, I, I take solace and inspiration for the recent waves of mobilizations from environmental radicalism of young folks to the global Black, Black Lives Move, uh, Matter movement, or closer to home, the, the recent waves of protests in Puerto Rico and Cuba. Um, and so w when we're thinking about like the potential futures right now, I do th want to think back as, a, as someone who studies the, the Spanish-speaking Caribbean particularly, um, I want us to think about, like, you know, I guess from that perspective. But, like, you know, this moment, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about with such spiraling inequality, growing sense of <coughs> impending catastrophe. I've been turning back to um, a book by Greg Grandin, historian Greg Grandin, um, and, and particularly the conclusion of his book, The Last Colonial Massacre, where he argues that the most important political fact of the region's long Cold War was not the brutality of violence and, and how it paved the way for new liberal restructuring. But rather, he sees the key takeaway as being the profound resilience and solidarity of social democratic thinking um, and solidarity, despite the genocidal violence of the era. Um, as popular groups have continued to resist the impetus to particularism and instead held tight to collective struggle and solidarity and pushed for policies of greater inclusion and greater equality. And so I wanted to focus then really on, on, on what we're seeing today in Puerto Rico, where trans rights activists, women's rights groups, youth workers, uh, urban residents, et cetera, are coming together on the streets to demand an end to austerity politics and corruption. Um, and you have like, you know, I wanted to, at one point that I wanted to talk about today is, is this question of cultural struggle that, that comes up throughout the book um, and how, um, you know, this underground culture that's emerging here um, sometimes even has support of, of uh, international titans like, like Bad Bunny, who's been a vocal supporter, not just of Puerto Rican culture and identity, but also has amplified the voices of activists on the ground. Um, so I do think we're in a moment both of like, you know, real despair or potential despair, potential catastrophe, but also renewed um, resilience, re renewed exciting kind of like politics on the ground. I mean, even in Cuba, um, which I imagine we'll talk about at some point, like think about the 2021 protests, um, which has been the largest since the Cuban Revolution, um, how they were led largely by young people, especially young black Cubans that have been really shut out of the liberi liberalizing economy. Um, and here in the United States, like the, the reporting on the protests has certainly tended to focus almost exclusively on their calls for freedom, 
um, with a apparent uh, call for an end to one party rule. But protesters were also mobilized uh, around the demands for food and vaccines. And so Cubans really were, I think, calling on the state to prolong, to fulfill longstanding promises of meeting citizens' basic elementary and medical needs during a period where economic disaster was, was gutting the public health se sector and state rations were a fraction of what they had been before. So the point here, I think, is that these protests, which were led by youth, particularly black youth, emerged out of longstanding demands for greater inclusion, more capacious visions of democracy than was allowed by the current authoritarian government, but also called for a fulfillment of the revolutionary state's longstanding promises. So this wasn't a call for an unrestrained capitalism like you hear in Miami, um, but for a more inclusive and egalitarian social democracy. And so, you know, we can go back and think more like, you know, the longer and midterm struggles that, that we can draw from to think about like the hopeful uh, sort of like the processes in the longer um, short term and medium term struggles that I think um, are we can turn to for guidance right now. Um, but I, I want to just sit with like the Puerto Rico and, and Cuba examples as, as, you know, where we can see demands for a kind of broad social democracy that we have that's really been missing in both Puerto Rico and Cuba. Um, I think I'll end it there, but I, we can open it up and think about Central America, think about um, struggles against, feminist struggles against Daniel Ortega's current government, um, thinking about the debates in Chile around the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera. I think we're actually at a really important moment where, if you, especially if you expand um, beyond the immediate Caribbean, um, there is some really exciting movement. Thanks, Danny. Um, Aaron? Yeah. Um, and please <coughs> use your mics. Bring them closer, yeah. Uh, yes, so um, great to be here and to have an opportunity to respond to this um, question. So um, I'll be brief and I'll just make about three big um, main points and suggest a vision. In terms of the political misrule and the thing I think about the most in the Anglophone Caribbean um, is the terrible levels of equality of political leadership that we have, particularly on the level of vision. Um, we have a region which is being destroyed and corrupted by neo-colonialism and neoliberalism. Um, I am always remember CLR James's famous comment in a 1972 conference that all of them, both in government and opposition, just need to go, okay? Um, and we feel this very pressingly, I think, in the contemporary Anglophone Caribbean, because over and over we see regimes in power that are fundamentally anti-worker um, and are very content to educate people into a particular politics of client dependency on the state and are willing to back up all of this with a uh, lurking, ruthless authoritarianism. Um, the second point I'd like to put on the table relates to the questions of the infrastructure within the Caribbean. And I was doing a number of focus groups in Barbados um, uh, two months ago in January now, um, and we were talking about visions for social renewal and change. And I was struck by how many of the participants, both in focus groups and elite interviewees, spoke about the question of infrastructure and the difficulties associated with the infrastructure. I'm talking about the physical infrastructure, the infrastructure in terms of education, in terms of water mains that were laid down over 100 years <laughs> ago, but also um, Caribbean public services, if we were to call them that. So in other words, the routing or the ability to get from one part of the Caribbean to another. Um, those who are a little more familiar with the region will be aware that there used to be an airline called Liat, okay? Um, and, uh, oh, we curse Liat. And we talked so badly about Liat, how horrible Liat was. But now Liat is gone. What has taken its place? Oh, we just really wish we could get Liat back, you know, after having to take, um, to put up with about 24 months of uh, the various private carriers that have overtaken um, Liat. So again, this is a part of this lack of vision, this question of a declining infrastructure, both on the level of specific countries, public infrastructure, and a Caribbean public infrastructure. 
And then thirdly, of course, there is the environmental question, without which we're not going to discuss anything in the Caribbean or really should discuss anything um, around the world. Uh, but the way that, due to climate change, the Caribbean has been exposed to these extraordinary um, conditions, um, uh, which many of us are aware of in terms of the hurricanes and what the hurricanes have um, actually done. And of course, also very um, importantly, the drought conditions that are affecting many countries in the Caribbean. So um, I hope our view for potential change well, um, I'm heartened that the fact, as my colleague has also said, that there is a new generation on the scene in the Caribbean that has made it very clear that they are intent on revising the conditions of post-colonial citizenship. Um, and think that these conditions of post-colonial citizenship need to be radically modified and updated. And I'm seeing that here in many of uh, the um, social um, movements which are emerging in the Caribbean. Um, yes, they have not um, created a new hegemony or one state power, but I see the ways in which they're in interested in influencing change. And a lot of my hopes and my dreams are with them. So I will just end there, given we're making brief comments. Thanks, Aaron. Patsy? Thank you, Brian. I see a region that's fragmented, and sorry if I'm more on the pessimistic side, sorry, at least to start with. I see a lack of vision, a lack of vision in the kind of developmental approaches, if you can call them that, that we take, um, or insistence on promoting an a tourism that excludes and marginalized people who are historically marginalized and um, and not one that empowers them, or insistence on um, strategies like you know extractivism, focusing on on the extraction of minerals, the absence of conversations about deep sea mining. And Jamaica is already um, engaging, you know, in this enterprise. There's absolutely no discussion on that. I really don't think there's a sense that climate change is really uh, uh, an existent, is, um, existential, yeah, a threat to our existence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in the in the way in which we should be seeing that. And I think part of the reasons, the reason why we don't have a sense of the crisis, and if we don't have a sense of where we are, we don't have a sense of where we're going, is because our thinking has been dominated by the international financial institutions and the development, or so-called development partners, who have basically pointed us in a very narrow direction as to what the future is. I, I, I don't think that there aren't bright people in the Caribbean or people who would like to do something different. I think that and the Caribbean exists in a global frame. We cannot talk about the Caribbean and Caribbean thought without thinking about global thought and the ways in which alternatives are very constricted. So I think that we have lost the ability to think because ultimately we feel that helpless, we feel there's nothing we can do about it because we don't control anything. And the absence of the Caribbean in, in, in those debates about where the world is and what we need to do to change this is evident in the kind of waves that Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley um, has been making in forefronting, upfronting climate change, but also linking the, the, the problems of um, global existence to the IFRs, IFIs, international financial institutions, to the dominant um, neoliberal and capitalist mode of production. And the fact that she stands out from the rest of the Caribbean leadership tells you how marginalized we are from these debates. I also think that we have to acknowledge in looking at the Caribbean and where we are, the deep-seated self-hatred that we have inherited that we still haven't been able to overcome, our tolerance for social and economic inequality, that we are okay in some Caribbean islands where there's homelessness to see black people lying on the streets and not think, not have a visceral response when we, when we see that. We 
are fine with unequal health and education incomes, as long as those of us in the elite can send our children to elite schools, as long as these elite schools and hospitals exist that can take care of the people who matter, or we have the money to be able to go and seek um, health care elsewhere, then we are fine. Um, we basically are not, we, you know, we accept a degree of impunity and inf infringement on individual rights and freedoms, especially when these are aligned with class and color. We don't really, um, we don't worry that much about the large numbers of black men incarcerated and women in our prisons, for example. We don't see that. We still have problems with how people wear their hair, so individual freedoms especially, of course, in terms of sexuality. Those things are, are really very um, confined, and we're happy with that. And, um, of course, persistent gender inequality. Okay, so I am being asked to cut. So, <laughs> so the way forward has to be grounded in a recognition of all of this, and we have to, to come to a kind of conversation about what it is we want from this region. And we have to start, and that's where I, I, I think we have a lot of a ground in common, with having conversations about what ideally we would like this region to see. And in that, we have to center people. Economic, economic policies are there to serve people. People are not there to serve economic policies. And we have to start off by thinking about how we value our people, what we want to see for them, and to shape economies around getting there. So I'll, I'll stop. With Thank this. you. Um, Alyssa Trotz. Hi. Hi. It's a lot said. I'm not sure much more can, uh, can be said. I want to thank Brian for this wonderful book. And it's a real honor to be part of this panel. And I really love the fact that students are in the room. And, and to all the folks online, hello, David Abdullah. I'm drinking water. He sent me an email asking me if I'm drinking Red Bull in the middle of Brian's book launch. It's, a, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's water. Um, I, I um, you know, I'm going to add sense, and I hope you forgive me. The present state of the Caribbean is dread. That's it. Um, if you want two more words, I will give you extractivism, and I will give you um, three words, ecological devastation. And I know that at Brown, you recently hosted Esther Figueroa from Jamaica and Immaculata Casimero from Guyana and others. So those are folks who are on the ground and really doing incredible work around this. Um, I, you know, Brian, I walk around with the Kilburn Manifesto and, and um, a sounding sort of printout of, of the conversation with Doreen Massey and Stuart Hall. So, it was wonderful to see it in this book, and it was actually my favorite um, chapter in this book, and one that I would go back to a lot. And and I really like what you did with it. I, I like the way. So I'm moving into the second section of your question. I love the way that you talked about the importance of languaging what it is we we want, and how that languaging happens in a dialogical re re relationship with action, and the way in which you drew on burning spare social living that takes us all the way back to independent thought and Caribbean freedom. And when Lloyd Best says, you know, we need a Caribbean susu. So what does it mean to think about these Caribbean imaginaries and these practices and the ways that, um, in the ways that Dave sort of um, gave us these examples from Cuba, from Puerto Rico, told us to think optimistically by looking at all of this social movement that is happening across Latin America and even right in the Caribbean, the riots that broke out in, um, in Suriname um, just last month um, against the high cost of living and in protest against the government of Santoki, and less folks think that those rioters were partial in 2020. Those similar riots um, against corruption and cost of living also broke out in that country against Bautista. So this week I, I taught a really difficult piece to give both my students and myself headache. Um, it's by the late literary and cultural theorist Lauren Berland. It's an incredible piece. It's impossibly dense, but so beautiful. And it's called The Commons, Infrastructures for Troubling Times. And in it, Berlant defines infrastructure as the movement or patterning of social form, the life world of structure. And what she tells us is that when infrastructures fail, that's when we notice them, like when a bridge falls or the train stops, when they glitch. That is the time when something can be repaired it can be reformed. In other words, that is a time in which something is either reproduced and put back on the same path, or there is a reset, 
or we can think in transformative terms of an infrastructure that takes us elsewhere. And it's a wonderful piece that's really about challenging sovereignty. And I'm gonna stop in one minute, but I, and I can come back to it in, in the conversation, but I wanted to use that to say that in this book, Brian, you bring up the language of manifesto, and it's one that I think has a lot of possibility, but I wanna suggest that manifesto is also what has been our problem because manifesto has a certain fatal potentiality that manifested itself in the 1980 elections in Jamaica that left 800 people dead over an orange or a green. And you know, I wanted to come back because in the Q&A, the last question, I think it was in the leeway, asked you about writing in a poetic or literary register. And it is remarkable to me that you don't write about Jamaica except for Paint the Town Red. That's where you dealt with 1980. It was like you had to find another kind of language in order to grapple with a horror from which Jamaica and the Caribbean, there are other kinds of violences and silences we've not recovered. So that when Tony Bogue spoke earlier today about the chopping, that chopping is not unrelated to these silences about those earlier moments. And so I'll just say I can come back in the conversation to talk a bit more about it, but to say that perhaps manifesto is about taking over it's about getting with the program it is about capture it is about those deadly ends and maybe we need to move from manifesto to making manifest to manifesting which is the verb from the noun to the verb and i can sort of explain ex tempo um, after we're all done thanks thank you Alyssa. um and i'm glad you introduced ex tempo which we had which is a Calypso word for when you sing improvised verses, like in jazz, improvisation. And we're going to do a lot of extempo um, in a little while. But right now, Francio, you're up next. Good evening, um, everyone. Thank you, Brian, for, for inviting me to this. It's evening for me. I think it's afternoon for you or, or morning. Um, let me use my three minutes to, to, to say a couple of things. First, I think I'm one of those that passes for a post-structuralist. I'm not a post-structuralist, but I pass for a post-structuralist. Um, and I pass for a post-structuralist because to me, the Caribbean is not one. The Caribbean is many, an entangled many, a singular plurality. So to think the Caribbean existential crisis from the Anglophone world, forgetting the Nederlanderphone world, is to me a mistake because the Caribbean has many different iterations. Now. When I was president of the University of St. Martin, we used to say the Caribbean, you can't think it in French, Dutch, English, and so forth. You have to think it as different gold kind of societies. And by gold, we meant that the economic might not be the last instance, but it matters. So we taught the Caribbean as being white gold, black gold, visa card gold, and digital gold societies. The white gold societies would be the societies of sugar, and bananas and so forth. It's what made Bonaire, which was part of the Dutch Caribbean, similar to St. Vincent and similar to parts of Haiti. When we talked about the black gold societies, we recognized that Curacao and Aruba, which Shell and the Lago Exxon oil, resembled Trinidad. They had similar dynamics. When we talked about the Visa card gold societies, we saw that Barbados and St. Martin were similar. These were hospitality-based societies in the deepest sense. And now we recognize that some parts of the Caribbean are going digital gold, Curacao, for instance, trying to implement a digital economy. These changes how you understand, to me, the Caribbean and what is taking place. There is no chopping in many of the Dutch Caribbean uh, societies right now. There is chopping in Suriname, which is not the Dutch Caribbean islands. So we have to be very specific about it. Now, I think that, that regardless of how singular or plural it is, there are certain things that, that matter. These are the questions for the way forward. I have 40, minutes, 40 seconds. There are three questions that we talk we have to answer. The first is the question of purpose, and it can't be answered only in academic settings. It has to be asked them throughout these societies. The question of purpose. This might be the first generation that will not have it as good as their grandparents had it and it's causing all kinds of anxieties. And education and intellectualism might not be the only route for that, for answering that question of purpose. In answering that question, you have to deal with the second question, which is the question of diversity. 
In the Dutch Caribbean islands, Aruba, 50% is newcomer. On St. Martin, 80% of the population is newcomer. So you have to think about the social recognizing that diversity. And the third question is the question of the sacred. In most societies, everything is for sale. The sacred is that which is non-negotiable. And if a society does not have that which is non-negotiable, then that society is in peril. And many Caribbean societies, in their singular plurality, are facing that peril in several different ways. So I'd like to talk about those types of things. And I've wasted my three minutes. I'm going to stop. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Francio. And um, Gabriel, you, you are last, or you could consider yourself the first of the second round, but you're last. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks so much, uh, Brian. And um, I just want to congratulate you on a book that is, um, it is not an easy read, but it is very readable. And I thought so much about how these essays could be taken to others who may not be used to thinking about these philosophical questions as very accessible text. And um, I want to thank you for, for that reflection. I think the um, heteropatriarchal masculine state is um, what is deeply threatened, what it seems that we call the left in the Caribbean without naming it as such. And I suppose I still wish that when we discuss the state, um, the demise of the left and so on, that we truly integrate the fact that what's failing is a particular approach to power, to the state, to people, and to nature that is, has been so key to feminist analysis, um, but which I still think is treated as marginal, but for me is absolutely central. And that we see that as in a state of hegemonic dissolution. Um, and I'm, I'm going to lead somewhere with this, which is that uh, I feel like um, the state that we are in, in the Caribbean, of this appointed to such things as, you know, the d destruction of the region and, um, and its peoples. But I feel the energy in the region is one of popular unrest. There is a deep simmering popular unrest, the kind that explodes at what on, in page, on page 204 you refer to as these peculiar moments when a converging happens, apparently spontaneously, but which of course can be traced. Um, and I think that popular unrest, that state of popular unrest is where our theorizing needs to be now. I mean, decades ago, you would have gotten scholars talking about political society in anthropology and others in anthropology you know, that uh, political form of organizing that is not necessarily ideologically bound, but is rooted in the unrest that people feel about their daily lives and circumstances, and how that creates connections that don't necessarily come from theory or ideology. And I say that because out of the last few years, certainly speaking from Trinidad and Tobago, where I am, in a state of extreme economic contraction since at least 2010 and and has that has not ended even with um, increased oil income um, we also see something that i want to point to which is uh, as you mentioned again page 204 and there were so many beautiful phrases in your book which is unprecedented collaboration and self-sacrifice and we see it precisely in the collapse of infrastructure we see it in the floods. We see it in um, what happens when people are hungry. We saw it during COVID. There's a kind of capacity of people to connect to each other that maybe is not guided by the mythos of revolution and the great thinking of the left, and which perhaps doesn't require the public intellectual to theorize it for it to happen, and rather to observe and be part of it um, and, and, and trace it, maybe. And I, I say all this because um, you know, your, your book wrestles with the lack of a self-evident counter-hegemonic philosophy. And, and there's a lot of hang-wringing about it, which, of course, I understand. 
But I, I think out of it, the hope for the Caribbean is in the capacity of people to care, which of course is the most fundamental feminist ethic at all, of all, uh, which has been the work of Andai and others, and which is where I think hope lies. Care, of course, can connect us up across as, as human beings through shared collapse, un, through a shared experience of the collapse of infrastructure. Care is, of course, the most powerful threat to the heteropatriarchal masculinist state which functions through division, through dividing people and creating hate and creating hierarchy. And so I want to, to bring us back to the fact that while we hangering about the state of social movements, that there is a vast and vibrant and has always been vast and vibrant 50 year feminist movement in the Caribbean, it is not perfect by any means, but for us to hang ring about social movements while this has been transforming the region against all odds is to me a lacuna in our thinking. And um, we fight still, we fight still and continue to fight still. And, and I think that there's hope, and we, we fight because we care. And I think that there's hope there. Thank you. Um, can we give them a little round of applause? <laughs> not, not only, for what they said, but for having kept it within time. This, this, this believe me, is very unusual uh, to have kept it within time. Um, I, I want to sort of bring us back down to earth by reading a set of statistics that I quote in the, in the book. And, and then I, 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 I'm, I'm going to you know, sort of switch gears and throw out a question for the second round. Uh, you know, which really is an extension of the first question. But on page 13, um, I quote myself, the range of statistics from across the region pointing to a crunch moment is overwhelming. In his insightful book, Beyond Coloniality, Aaron Kamogisha gives a snapshot of some highlights, including Guyana being among the countries with the highest suicide rates in the world. Unemployment in Grenada between 2013 and 15, averaging over 30 percent. The rates of sexual assault in three Caribbean countries ranking among the top 10 countries with the highest rates of sexual assault. The seven countries with the highest rates of educated workers emigrating to OECD countries, all coming from the Caribbean and every Anglophone Caribbean country except Trinidad and Tobago being in a formal structural adjust adjustment agreement with the IMF. This was when it was written in 2019. Um, to these must be added that among 180 countries measured on the 2019 Corruption Perception Index, three countries, Jamaica, Guyana, and Trinidad, were ranked among the most corrupt. And tragically, that in terms of global, global murder rates per 100,000 persons, four Anglophone Caribbean countries ranked in the top 10, with Jamaica at four, while seven altogether ranked in the top 21. And then I go on to say, for the Anglophone Caribbean, this is not a moment of happy cohabitation with the neoliberal model, nor is it one of peaceful complacence with a functioning and successful parliamentary democracy. Rather, as Norman Gervin has warned, this is a time of growing existential crisis in which the failure of the post-colonial model to deliver a better life for the majority, their perception of rising prosperity for only a minority, and the growing possibility of environmental disaster on the horizon has led not to popular revolt, but rather an emerging consensus of all-round hopelessness with a surge to the exits, and for those who can't make it, a turn to the bending and breaking of rules to survive and to try to achieve the good life by any means necessary. Okay, so that is um, my quote. Um, and what I'd like this round of conversation with whoever wants to pick it up is what does the Caribbean look like in 50 years' time? What does or should? What? Both. Thanks, thanks for providing that sort of intervention, because what does and what should the Caribbean look like in 50 years' time? Anybody? 
I, I think that's too difficult a question to ask. I mean, so much bring could your, happen. Your <laughs> yeah, uh, we don't know. Uh, 50 years on, I mean, it's just really hard to, you know. Precise, well, Patrick, Patrick, let me interrupt you and then come back to you. Precisely because we don't know. And if, if, if we think certain of the Marxist tradition is, is this hesitancy to look beyond the conjuncture, um, let us imagine <coughs> what does and what should it look like as an act of imagination, as a poetic act, as opposed to uh, uh, you know, an act of social scientific analysis. Can I just say that I'm, I'm just reading, I'm not necessarily answering the question, but I'm just reading some information from the EU on the French Caribbean. And they have a 20-year projection of what the region would look like. And, is, and there are very clear patterns, one of which is a loss, aging of, of societies, but a loss of young people um, to Europe so that the populations are going to be much less, so lower than, than they are now. And this is based on high levels of poverty, low levels of access to education and certification. So I think that, I don't know that we have done that kind of exercise for the Caribbean, but we definitely should. And I mean, the question, and I'll hand it over to Paget without answering, is if present conditions continue unchanged, then what would it look like? What road are we heading down? Mm -hmm. But if it's to change, then what needs to happen? I think that's, that's what you're asking. I, I can live with that, yes, absolutely. Paget, you want to take it up or are you still hesitant? Sure, no, I mean, yeah. okay. Uh, I see this present moment uh, as very similar to uh, the period uh, between World War I and World War II. The collapse of the first experiment in neoliberal markets, right, collapsed, uh, right, uh, 1914, and led to the start of World War I. And the, the failure uh, to find a quick solution, we got Mussolini, we got Hitler, we got fascism, all of this stuff, crime, uh, we got the Depression, right? Ex all the stuff. Uh, what got us, what got the world out of this? Uh, we saw democratic socialism, the New Deal, and of course, new technology. That what was done uh, with uh, democratic socialism, welfare states, all of that stuff, that's what got us out of the last major crisis of global capitalism. We are in a similar crisis, but of course one that's very different, uh, because in addition to economic and class problems, we now have environmental, racial, sexual, all of these other problems coming in uh, at the same time. And these have to be addressed. Uh, we cannot do what we did in the past. Okay, we put the race question and the gender question on hold and at attend to the economic and class problems. Huh? So these are some of the uh, difficulties. So in my way of thinking, I would say, well, uh, if we know that uh, technology uh, was a factor, a positive factor in getting us out of the last, cr the last crisis, if we know that democratic socialism, welfare state policies, uh, and that sort of stuff uh, was what got us out, right? <clears throat> then I think we have to think along those lines, at least in addressing the economic dimensions uh, of the crisis. Of course, we cannot just copy. We have to rethink uh, what welfare states or what democratic socialist states uh, would look like today in this context. Clearly, they would have to be different uh, and that sort of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> and we have to think about the impact of uh, digital technology. 
uh, I think we can all see that this is revolutionizing uh, the world. And there's this great debate going on as to whether or not this technology will have the same kind of growth and transformative impact as the industrial technology of the post-World War II era. So if indeed it turns out that this technology is going to be as transformative as the industrial uh, technologies in the post-World War II period, this is a positive, right? We can expect that you know, some of the uh, economic problems uh, that we're having uh, will uh, get resolved by this. If on the other hand it turns out that this is going to be, as many people are suggesting, a low growth technology, uh, you know, then it's not so good. Since this was the way we got out of the last major, last major crisis. And so, who is we? Huh? Who is we? In terms of what? You're talking about we, and I'm not sure who the we is and how much control well, do we have, whether no. it's a Caribbean we, a global we, a global and how the we is differentiated. And no, I, I'm talking about, okay, this is a World War, the, 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 the collapse of the 30s was a global, global collapse. I think that the problems, so that for example, you were talking about rising levels of inequality in the Caribbean and so forth. Here in the United States, the levels of inequality are even greater. So there's a common state of capitalism that is generating these unacceptable levels of inequality globally. We have them in Sri Lanka, we have it in India, right? And not only that, but as the left, this is what we predicted. We knew that markets left to themselves, this is what we get. It was there, right, uh, before World War I, right? And in his book, uh, Piketty has shown <laughs> that right now, we are right back to the levels of inequality yeah. that we had before World War I. Okay, um, Alyssa wants to intervene, oh. and she's behaving very properly. Alyssa, you can actually intervene without putting up your hand in this discussion. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, it's, an, it's, it's a really hard question to ask. Almost, you know, we can't really answer it, especially if you take up Stuart Hall's politics without guarantees. Like, where will we be in 50 years? It, it all depends. And at the same time, I understand and, and agree with the impulse because, you know, Tracy Robinson, and I think it was a response to Jackie Alexander's pedagogies of crossing and small acts, had said it's not enough to talk about what we're trying to fight or save ourselves from. We have to have some imaginative capacity to think about what we're saving ourselves to. And so in that sense, I think it's important. I think these are really big questions. The ones that Padgett put on the table are big questions. Uh, you know, um, it. And so let me begin by saying it obviously is not easy to be in a position of leadership or in power. And Patsy, I actually don't think there's the single government in the Caribbean that is against extractivism right now. I will just go on record and say that. Um, it is not easy to be in political office. I could barely run the Department of Women and Gender Studies, and I probably put Trinidad as, 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 I, as I speak right now. So, so recognizing the responsibilities of leadership. But I want to go out on a limb, a limb because it's something I don't know that much about, and a limb because it's also something I'm preparing for some talks I have to give in a few weeks. And, and I want to begin with, um, with the fact that you know one of the fundamental problems in the Caribbean, and Norman Gervin made this you know, those statistics that you cite there, Brian, like in 2011, I think it was the Oil Field and Trade Workers Union, Norman gives this talk and he cites these figures. So it's like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, this stuff is, 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 seems to be persistent. How do we address it without ending up with some failed state notion in which the Caribbean people are backward because the Caribbean people are backward? So I want to begin by saying, to me, a fundamental problem is that the Caribbean has one of the highest net food import bills in the world. And the crisis is perfectly captured. I don't know if Esther Figueroa is on this call, but the crisis is perfectly captured. The contradiction is perfectly captured by the fact that right in Jamaica, 
right in cockpit country, you have bauxite mining going on in the heart of Maroon country, where there's a whole different relationship to land, there's a whole different relationship to food sovereignty, there's a whole different way of languaging one's relationship with, with humans and more than humans. And so I think for me, that tension is really something we need to think about. And I want to suggest two things that, in fact, what Gab spoke about, which is like this ordinary capacity, these ethics and this relationship of care, it isn't something new. And this is something I've been thinking about in relation to these talks I'm writing. So, you know, Paget went back to the World War I, mm -hmm. and I started with bauxite mining and cockpit pot country, but we could also take a walk down to Erna Broadbury's black space in Jamaica as well. But let's go back to World War I, because this was a time when Jamaica, Suriname, and Guyana basically helped to bring the Allied war back home because they were producing 80 to 90% of the bauxite that went into the aluminum that, fought, that took those planes into the war. And let's go back to something like bauxite industries in Jamaica, Guyana, and Suriname. If people were doing what they always did in the interstices of bauxite, if all of the relations of care that Gab talks about, that we don't look at because, bless their hearts, the folks writing critically, critically about that period were more concerned with the industry itself and not necessarily with the informal relations of social reproduction that were taking place elsewhere. But if we began with all of that resistant work, would the strategy have been, and this is where I come back to manifest as opposed to manifesto, would the strategy have been to nationalize? to take over, to just exchange and repeat, a glitch that is not a change. Could we have thought work a cooperative? Could we have thought radical land reform? Could we have thought multiplying all of those informal possibilities that operated in the interstices of a racist apartheid bauxite company, at least in Guyana, and come up with something different? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and the racist um, features were in Jamaica as well, so th those were common. Um, do we have any responses on screen or in the audience? I can. Oh. Gab, Gab, go ahead. Um, to um, take to amplify some of what all of you are saying. I mean, not so much the prediction of fifty years, but again, the idea of where is our hope for the next 50 years. Um, I think there's actually a lot happening, which I could just short, you know, the cognitive shortcut for it is around solidarity economies. But of course, you could take it apart, and it's much more complex and, and um, contradictory and so on. But there, I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, connections that are happening amongst communities of people who are trying to survive in the necropolitics of the region by making those kinds of connections. And the example from Puerto Rico that we all know so well with the, um, the efforts around providing solar power and then out of that community solidarity and then out of that a kind of um, geographical autonomy that's also linked to the space that it's in ecologically as well as its watershed. For me that kind of recent, recent, no, that kind of connecting in spaces where people are where they are sharing um, those kinds of grids or where they are coming together in various kinds of solidarity economies. To me, I see those um, mushrooming. I mean, mushrooms are small, tiny things that you can miss. Um, but I see them, but they're, but they're built on these networks that are resilient and underground and knowledgeable and sharing information. And so for, for me, as we survive whatever we're going to survive and and I don't think we can quite picture it because things that we're picturing are, are may accelerate on us what we think is 30 years ahead maybe 10 years ahead mm -hmm. and um, and I think we're in a time where we have to really question some of our we can make population assumptions and so on but there's a lot 
you can one hurricane can decimate the entire GDP of an island overnight. And so I think we have to be a little, I think what we can do is pay attention to what may be able to make lasting bonds between people that can allow them to both survive, but to also create the kinds of connection that have historically been the basis for ordinary people being able to um, exist in these vast political and economic orders that were colonialism, that is neoliberalism, that's you know the 22 men owning as much as the bottom three billion in the world and so on. Um, and so I wanna point our attention to that, both what I think will be our strength and is already our strength um, as under threat as it always is by intersecting divisions, but also what should be under our focus in the next 50 years. And even if it is not under our focus and we ignore it, I think people are doing it anyway because there's some kind of recognition that uh, this is how they're going to be able to survive. And I say this because of a very, very mundane, uh, you know, not very profound example of how some communities survived during the pandemic and how much connection and generosity and care that we saw in people providing food for each other um, in, this t in that time. And, um, and I think that, that provides us with a way forward without requiring central, um, central organizing. Because central organizing ultimately has, because of the governor mode in the Caribbean, as Lloyd Best would call it, central organizing ultimately becomes a, a, a site and a source and a propulsion for alienation. And that's the legacy that we need to, in a way, shift from and not just try to recapture. Thanks so much, Gab. Um, I want to come back to this theme that you're on, but uh, Danny and then Patsy. So I just want to follow up on a, on a couple of points that have been brought up. And it's a, a thread definitely throughout the book, which is, you know, uh, there's this question of, of cultural struggle that's really throughout the book, right? Um, when you think about, like, you know, how do we transform culture or, like, or draw out aspects that are currently in the culture um, that help build solidarity, connection, you know, um, care, uh, to put it in terms of Gabrielle, um, as opposed to the culture of, like, atomization and indifference and, you know, acceptance of, of suffering and inequality um, that we're seeing right now, which is, like, an effect, of course, of neoliberalism in so many ways and, of course, corruption, um, all of which works to atomize um, and, and build a sort of common sense of, of despair and hopelessness, right? Um, and so, like, I think, you know, kind of moving forward about, like, what, what our role, and I mean not just, like, our role on the panel, but, like, our collective role here is thinking about this question of, of cultural struggle and how we, um, how we see a way forward, right? How do we get from here to there, um, and how do we see the, the work that we do as scholars or as people living in the world um, to help, like, you know, uh, stitch together or support um, those threads that are already existing um, where we see that kind of connectivity and care, um, which is such an alternate, like, which is the precondition, really, um, for any kind of future that's not horrible. Yeah. Thanks. Patsy. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that there are some, I mean, there is, it is, we can see if, some trends already here that would give us a sense of what we can expect in, in 50 years. And Paget, I appreciate your, where I think you're coming from in that we are part of a global system and we have some of this, or, or, our problems are reflected globally. So we're, you know, the change has to be global. But to come to the Caribbean, I think there's a lot happening that, I mean, of course, if, if I, we can, the problems that you know we have mentioned can be intensified. So we can have total degradation. Um, oil, a mad rush for oil all over the Caribbean because oil is all over the Caribbean. A mad rush to 
to um, exploit the deep seabed without any care about um, the environmental cons consequences. The con our continued role as providing resources for, for real people to improve their lives and do and make money off it while you know we're looking for employment that doesn't happen. I mean, all these things can 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 be intensified. But I think we also when when we think about the Caribbean, we don't really know enough and pay enough attention about the kinds of agreements that we're entering into, like like our intensification of our relationship with the European Union, for example, in the post post Cotonou agreement which gives um, Europe even more space to invest, even in, 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 in our economies, and even more potential for exploitation with our marginalization. And that's there, we just signed that, you know? So I think that we have these discussions, but because some of us are looking more at the economic arrangements, and some of us are looking more at the politics and things. We don't really have a sense of how we're implicated into these broader processes, because our trade people and our go off and negotiate these agreements with, of, with feeling that they don't really have too many alternatives. And we, I don't think we think about what the implications of those things are. So I think that is something we need to, to pay attention to. I think there's, there is an appreciation of the care economy. Every time there's a hurricane, we see how people come together. In the Caribbean, people don't wait for government to come and clear roads after a hurricane. They, there's a lot of community help. I mean, when Grenada was devastated by Hurricane Ivan, you had Jamaican um, soldiers coming to help with, with, with road clearing and restoring power. You had Vincentian sending food, cooking food and sending food to Grenadians. I mean, there, there are lots of indications of that. But what we have not learned is to institutionalize those and to fight for them when every, all kind of interpersonal relationships are now seen as transactions that must be quantified. And I think that's, we know these things are important. They do happen, but it's how to get them, a, you know, validate them in their own right and to, to decapitalize them or, or stop that trend that, that moves them in that direction. And we have not spoken about the regional space. And I think the regional space is important. The regional space is either one that, as it's currently going, can deliver the Caribbean hook, line, and sink. Sinker. Sinker. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker to, the, to Europe, to anybody, to Cuba, to any, not Cuba, China, not, not Cuba, to China, anybody who is there, to the US, right? Or it can be one where we can actually take a stand and try to rethink a different Caribbean and how our, sol how, how our solidarity can lead to a different outcome. So I just want to put the regional um, in, as part of that story. What, what I'm hearing, um, you wanted to come in, but, but, but quickly, what I'm hearing um, are some great ideas on the table, but there's a tension between uh, what Alyssa and Gabriel are saying, which uh, Alyssa would manifest to unmanifest, and Gabriel with recognizing initiatives from below. Is, is initiatives from below and an alternative world that is, that is present um, in what people are doing. Patsy also hinted at this, um, as did Daniel. But there's, there's also this, this troubling problem of the state, right? The state as it is. They, I mean, all of these countries have a state. I mean, that is how they make agreements with, with the European Union or with Cotonou or what have you. There is a state um, which was seen at a certain moment in time as our savior. If, you, if we were able to, con to control the state, to have free elections, to win power, then we could do this and that. And now the state enters the arena in the 21st century as a problem in itself. Um, in other words, we don't just, it's not just there for the manipulation, but it is a problem in itself to the point where we're talking about initiatives that not only um, um, ignore the state, but in an almost 
anarchic sense, and I'm using here anarchic in a, in a good sense, not, not in the way it's used, in an anarchic sense, moving beyond the state. And I'm, I'm just putting on the table, um, the state is real, right? I mean, if you go to Jamaica, um, you can go to jail if you do certain things or not. And not everybody goes to jail, and this is a problem, right? Only some people do for, for wrongs committed. Um, how do we imagine the state in the 21st century beyond where we are now? And how do we, do we imagine a space for the people which Gabriel is describing? And, and this also relates to Patsy's point about the region. Because you know, I, for one, readily admit I'm a regionalist. You know, I believe that um, you know, this is the, the heart of the modern experience in the Caribbean. You know, we're all transported peoples brought here. And um, you know, from Cuba and the Bahamas right down to, frankly, right down to Brazil, but certainly down to the Guyanas. You know, this is one cultural region rich in it and, and increasingly rich in its recognition of itself. How does that fit in to so the question of the state, the question of, um, of, of the, um, the region as a whole, and the question of, of, of this new space beyond the maroon space, Alyssa, beyond that of, um, of the state? Yeah. But I, I yeah. don't no, think oh, I okay, so. Oh. Yeah, I'm glad that loud as well. I actually think the state was actually central to what I was saying, but I, I think others should speak. Okay. Aaron. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to come in here partly as a response to the earlier question and then going over. I'll just make a couple of points. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I do agree, Brian, that the state is very important also because um, we want to... The, the ethics of care that Gabrielle has spoken about, very important, is going to be the foundation of that social living that is going to also transform the meaning and the sense of Caribbean citizens' relation to each other and the very terrain of Caribbean post-colonial citizenship, most definitely. We also simultaneously do not want to and cannot also let the state off the hook when the state has a certain responsibility to its citizens, which it would like to abdicate, okay, and would very well turn over to local communities. So there's a tension there, and this is a tension, of course, that Gabrielle completely understands. I'm not, you know, suggesting um, that um, she doesn't. Um, I think, though, that there is, if only one could read one's own handwriting, you know, um, I have something <laughs> very profound <laughs> scribbled here. Um, but uh, I think that... I'm also fascinated by the comment, the earlier comment that Padgett was making about technology and the changing transformation within the global political economy that created certain kinds of spaces for the Caribbean at a particular time and what might be happening with the technology now. Um, and I'll just give you an example um, from Barbados. And the point is not, this is not being um, advanced as a successful um, example or something that will transform the Caribbean, but in terms of how these things work. So um, during COVID, um, a um, Barbadian um, thinker, um, let me see, um, consultant, came up with the idea of a welcome stamp initiative, saying that, okay, we have a situation in which, as a result of a technology we have now, there is a moment in which where one's work, where one lives, and where one works has actually been, or do not necessarily have to be the same space, okay? Um, and so the idea was this, that people would become digital nomads, they would come to Barbados and places in the Caribbean, they would actually live there while they're actually still being employed by North American and European companies. It actually took off very well. 
there were hundreds and hundreds of applications. There were a lot of people who actually came to Barbados in order to actually be part of the system. And um, I know the guy who came up with it well, you know, I'm, I mean, it's no secret, his name, Peter Thompson. And we've had some fascinating conversations about his clients and how that particular kind of initiative worked and the ways in which um, uh, some of them were leveraging their ability to actually live in the Caribbean in which they felt that they could have a quality of life that they could simply could not have in the North American um, winter, but also in North America, in the Caribbean, while at the same time having a different relationship to the space, to the very exploitative and the very narrow ways in which tourists actually relate to the space. Am I suggesting that as any kind of transformation of Caribbean political economy or potential transformation? No, I'm not. But I'm saying that um, there are ways in which we desperately have uh, to continuously move and see the ways in which um, uh, the global e political economy can offer us a moment, uh, can offer us a potential hedge that we can actually use in the Caribbean. Um, but it all goes back, of course, to the question of vision. And the problem is, is that many Caribbean state managers, to use um, the term that Jackie Alexander really put into my vocabulary, thinking about the Caribbean state managers, and not just the politicians, okay? Because, as I've said in my book, I actually think that a lot of the, um, the state managers, the senior public sector workers and the private sector state managers are even worse than the career politicians because at least the politicians think that they have a constituency that they're trying to respond to, however they respond to it. But if you see those private sector state managers and the, uh, the senior public sector state managers, they could care less. You know, They don't have any constituency. Um, but if um, their gain is just individualistic exploitation of what control of state or private resources allows them to do, and they're consistently able to get away with a lack of a vision or a lack of a general purpose, um, that becomes a problem. And it becomes a problem for the region in total when the islands are balkanized into these micro-colonial nationalities and no one is planning with a vision for what regional sovereignty might look like rather than just simply the regime's survival of a particular political party in a particular island. I've spoken too long. Okay. I'll, uh, Fran Fr Francio, Francio, go ahead. Yes, can I, can I just be very brief? I, when I read your book, Brian, I did not, I necessarily thought that you connected the question of the state to the question of thinking beyond capitalism. Because as I read your book, the state is to me, and I wrote it down, an agonistic dissensus of classes that poses as though it has a consensus but that agonistic dissensus of, of classes, that is the state, should never be confused or mistaken for the national. It is always tied to capital. And therefore, to me, what you're actually posing is you're saying actually that the question of the state is tied to the question of thinking beyond capital. And therefore, many of the examples on the ground that are being given, the question is what is their relation to that agonistic dissensus? To me, that is, 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 is the gist of your book. So it's not an alternative, if I understand it correctly. It's actually forcing us to think these three things together. That's a question. Well, I, I agree with you. I think you said it better than I did. And I'm still tying with some of the things you said. But I, 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 I think I agree with you. Yes. We have questions on your thing. Um, Kate, yeah. We have two questions for, uh, for you all from the Zoom participants. The first is from Esther Figueroa that was just mentioned, I think, by Professor Trotz and who was also here. I'm sorry, by <coughs> Professor Hossein and who was here recently on campus. And she said, um, I might have missed it, but I haven't heard any discussion of the foundational and powerful role of religion in the region, from the everyday to social movements, to social organization, to identity, to policies and governance. Good question. Anybody want to jump in? Everybody avoiding this ball? <laughs> no, I, I would just say... Um, I volunteer in France here. I could say something. I would volunteer in France here because France is the only one of the panelists who actually did mention religion. So in your three minutes. Okay, France and then 
era. He mentioned okay. the sacred. Yeah. I mentioned that's true. Which is exactly why I'm looking at him because <laughs> you know Jackie yeah. Alexander reminds us that not the way in which we often think of religion often sort of colonizes that space and is not the same as thinking about spirit, is not the same as thinking Absolutely. about sacred. But but I, I would like to defer to my brother Francio to answer. Uh, let, me, let me try and be brief on, on this matter and, and go back to Meeks's book. Um, because somewhere in the book you actually inspired by Rastafari where you say you're seeking another living, a kind of social living or liberty. And then you quoted, I quote you when you say, liberty is the Rastafarian word for a decent, moral, clean, environmentally friendly way to live the good life. And I marked that down and then I said, perhaps instead of the good life, we should replace that by the gifted life. And if you replace it by the gifted life, then you actually are thinking beyond capital. Because thinking beyond capitalism, and capitalism is an economy of the possible. And even when you try to think with that possible, with impossibilities, you remain always tied to a kind of humanism. But if you think the antithesis of that kind of capitalism, to me, is a gift economy. It's recognizing, as the Rastafarians would say, give thanks. In the Dutch Caribbean Isles, when people say give thanks, I learned from the Rastafarians, they're also saying giving thanks for the air. So they're not only giving thanks to a person, they're giving thanks to that whole circulation of gifts that allows people to breed. So thinking life as a plethora of gifts that are constantly co-appearing with one another, that to me is the question of the sacred. And if you can think life as that plethora of gifts co-appearing, then it contains necessarily also what is called in Dutch at giftige, the poisonous, because every gift etymologically is tied to poison. It has possibilities that can be negative. So you don't need the tragic for that, David Scott. If you think gift economies, you recognize it already as part of it. So I think if we're going to move and think beyond capital, we might have to start at least thinking about these things as gifts and trying to recognize the, um, the uh, what do you call that, uh, the gems that are contained in Rastafari and many of these other kinds of philosophies of life that emerge uh, on the ground. Um, to me, that is, the, is, is, is where one should go with the question about religion, not necessarily these religions that are very capital, like the, uh, uh, I might uh, insult people, but the born again and so forth, that's just capitalism. Mm -hmm. That's you. not the gift economy I'm talking about. Thanks, Francio. Um, Aaron, you want to pick up? Oh, um, no, <laughs> not much to say after um, that comment. All uh, just to acknowledge um, Esther's point and to say yes, um, Caribbean people's greatest cultural investment has been in religion and spirituality when one thinks about it, and not in cricket as certain um, <laughs> other Caribbean <laughs> academics think. And um, I yes, I think that it's uh, it's central, it's important, but of course. Many Caribbean academics have been trained to think um, in very secular, uh, from in a very secular lens, and Jackie Alexander certainly is one of those who have shown us a way towards thinking in the different guise and in a different light, as others have done. So I think that. Um, it's um, given the kind of profound rethinking that we are doing um, and the interdisciplinary knowledge and bases in which we're trying to construct new Caribbean futures, um, that a memory and the knowledge of the importance um, of the sacred, of spirituality, um, is something we all have to incorporate on some level in our work in the same way that none of us are working on the Caribbean humanities or the social sciences in the region now without thinking about the environmental question, for example. Thank you. Uh, you want to tell us the other question? Yes. So this, uh, there are actually two from Zofia Edwards. Oh, Zofia. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Or it's a question with a follow-up clarifying statement. Mm -hmm. Building on Paget and Gabrielle's earlier comments, in the interwar years when these crises that we face today became acute, it was worker movements where women were leading, mm -hmm. movements deeply embedded in communities that led the struggle against capitalist hyper-exploitation. Can we conceptualize 
what can and should be in the next 50 years without thinking about Caribbean movements of working people and how we, Caribbean people, might ident intensify those organizing efforts, i.e., what is the role of unions, if any? No, I, I, I think that's a, a key uh, question here. Uh, when you look at the number of strikes that we see uh, going now, we can see that there's a sharp rise uh, in union activity. Uh, and I'm hoping that, that that will continue. Because it, again, if you look at how we got out of the major crisis of the first neoliberal experiment, let's not forget that. The first neoliberal experiment started in 1842. It crashed in 1914 with World War I. And uh, we need to understand that, how we got out of it. We got into it, and we got out of it. And I think we need to look at what we did. Trade unions, uh, organizing workers was a big part of how we got out of the crisis of the 1930s. So. The, uh, the leader of the um, AFL-CIO, I thought she had this brilliant idea, uh, anyway, blocking her name at the moment, uh, but she is trying to collaborate with MIT to create a Workers Institute of Technology. And she wants to collaborate particularly around um, 3D printing. Mm. And I, I just assumed that every union in America would have rallied behind her. She's not getting any support, right? But to me, this is the kind of move that has great potential. And it's something, those are the kinds of issues that I think uh, are there in the present moment, <laughs> that if we recognize and really try to push could change dramatically, right, uh, the outcome. It's innovations like that. I would also say, note at this point in time, at least in, in a lot of islands like Antigua, that where I hang out, the number of young people doing startups I mean, is just incredible. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the guy, uh, uh, Don Charles, who tries to help and fund a lot of these startups, he now spends more time in Jamaica helping startups in Jamaica uh, than in Antigua. I tried to call him last night. I couldn't get him. He was in Jamaica. Uh, so there's a lot of innovative activity going on that we just don't know exactly where they're going to lead. So let's not close uh, you know, the picture to prematurely. There's a lot here that's new. And uh, I just think uh, we should keep the example uh, of how we got out of the crisis in the 1930s and be as open, innovative, as imaginative and optimistic. I like the word optimism in Brian's book. Uh, and we just keep moving forward. Well, sorry, sorry to, to come in here with a sort of sideways point uh, ag against optimism, it seems. <laughs> but, but I'm just putting it in there, in the mix. And that is, a, you know, the whole debate around robotization, which is one of the key moves of this era in which, you know, robots are coming into the picture for, for you know, all along the line from assembly to, um, to construction um, and with robots making robots being a critical element of that equation. So therefore, sort of closing the open loop on employment by virtue of technology as opposed to opening it up. I just wanted to put that in the, in the mix because I raise it in the book as, as something that troubles me that, you know, in, in other words, to put it simply, um, yeah, so they're, they're new technologies. But, but, but the right. technologies are being made by, by robots, um, and therefore, if robots are making those robots, then that, 
that avenue towards um, the Bible School. The second thing I want to put in the picture, um, and there are people wanting to come in behind me, um, is the environment I don't think has been given the, the necessary space we need to give it on this climate. I mean, Paget, your entire sister island of Barbuda had to be evacuated because of a hurricane um, in an unprecedented develop, historical development and the implications of that for moving forward and the environment generally. I'm going to go to the, our panelists out of the room, our Zoomers, but before I do, the audience in this room, again, very peaceful, very calm, you're allowed to intervene, right? You're allowed to intervene and ask difficult questions or, or problematic questions. Um, yeah, who was Gabby it? Who? Was Gabby? Yeah, I, um, I really like the question of the union. Like, what is the place of union organizing in this time? And um, it doesn't appear as much in your writing, this, you know, considering this trajectory in this particular book. But I think what is really interesting, and this is a conversation that I've been having with union comrades here, is the unions have not uh, reconceptualized themselves around precarity um, in what were stable jobs in the first place. And they continue, you know, it's almost like how your book, as you said, it's reflecting on, on a time gone, although somehow we're still in the moment of seeing it pass at the same time. And the unions are just not out there taking up the contemporary questions of the moment, which is how are people experiencing labor and what is the collect, whatever that labor is, you know, that form, that site, and so on. And then what is the sense of collective uh, um, uh, community and collective, um, you know, rights? Like, you know, they are just not taking up these questions. So if I think back to um, Elma Francois, organizing in the 1930s. Again, the feminist tradition really offers us so much that somehow we gesture to, but in not centralizing in our political trajectory, somehow we, we sometimes miss. You know, the, she, was, she and others were organizing unemployed um, persons. You know, at that time, housewives were being, um, um, were being organized you know, homeless persons, you know, what's happening to those people? So many people in the Caribbean make an income out of their homes. It, there is just, you know, the economy has, is a very different one from how I think unions are currently organizing in the region. And uh, their mode, and, and that is also has to do with the masculinist approach to a kind of, you know, fighting stance and a kind of belligerent um, defensive posture, you know, man against man, the state as man, the union, you know, and so on, as opposed to the work of figuring out and where are the laboring people and what are the solidarities that the unions can build in order to revitalize themselves. And, and they are not doing that because they haven't realized that the ground has shifted on them in a major, major way. So, you know, you can close an entire refinery in Trinidad and the union is, is, is left unable to understand its raison d'etre in this moment, which still exists because of the multiple kinds of labor precarity that exist and the basis for organizing laboring people across sectors and across kinds of work on the basis of, of these precarities. And so I think the union question is, is, is absolutely critical, but I think these are some of the considerations around it. Thank you. Uh, Patsy? Oh, and, Alisa, okay. and then Alisa. No, I, I just am fully in support of unions, and I think they're absolutely necessary. Um, but 
when some of our societies have so many people who are marginalized from the economy, high levels of unemployment, especially youth unemployment, when we still have um, fairly substantial subsistence agricultural sectors, and if we move in the direction of de-emphasizing export agricultural production and emphasizing food subsistence um, production, then that group of people will grow. So how do we see their organizing potential and, and what the agenda of that might be? Because I think for a lot of us, the, the, the people who are employed and are formally within the space of unions is so small that, if, that I don't think it's a driving force that we think it might be. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Thank you. Alyssa? Yeah, I was actually going to agree with um, now Pat, Gabby and, and Patsy. I, I think Zafia is quite right, and unions are really important. I think certainly in the United States, there is a certain sense of dynamism and energy. Um, when you look, for example, at the Amazon organizing, and it was, you know, um, black women, women of color, queer folks, and, and a lot of the organizing is not just around at the point of production. So I think there are a couple of things from what Paget said I picked up, which is, you know, how do we think about the changing nature of work in the Caribbean? That's one. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing has to do with, as Gab said, how do we actually understand this thing called labor? Um, the third thing is, how do we organize so it's not just the point of production? And there's certainly precedence in Latin America during the decades of the military dictatorship. There was a lot of collective community um, organizing that took place through unions, but was happening in communities, community kitchens that um, showed mm -hmm. up in places like Peru, for example. So, and, and, and I also think that we can find many of these contemporary examples. So in the Caribbean right now, thinking about domestic worker organizing, so the work of Clotilde Walcott in um, Nude in Trinidad and Tobago, taken up by Ida LeBlanc, Shirley Price in Jamaica, the Caribbean Domestic Workers Network that Red Thread in Guyana is part of. So <coughs> folks organizing in that sense, even though we might talk about contemporary precarity, informality has always been part and parcel of the occupational landscape of the Caribbean. And so when we're thinking about unions, we need to think about their incredible capacity and possibility, but also about some of the ways in which unions never quite captured that kind of um, um, occupational multiplicity. And then, you know, and I won't get into this, but also the ways in which unions got captured by party politics. Um, and I'm speaking, obviously, you know, from Guyana, but we could think about this in the rest of part, other parts of the Caribbean as well you know, the, the, the notion of betrayal that Andaya writes about that comes up especially in the writings of George Lamy. Thank you. Any, any from the floor? Any, any questions or, or clarifications even that anybody might have? Oh, my class, everybody's supposed to ask each of us one question. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was the assignment for today, to ask each person ask one question. Yeah, but not my class didn't have any such requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, yeah, yeah, okay, Inslee, yeah. I actually, oh, thank you. You, you wanna want to identify yourself? Oh, yes, I'm Inslee LaShore. I'm in Africana Studies and Poli Sci, assistant professor. Um, and I actually wanted to ask a question about the, you know, the nation state, right? Um, and especially the way that the state is being conceived and to think about the people as um, political actors. And there were a few things that stood out to me from the discussion. And I just want to put them on the table and ask you to think about it. Um, so one thing that uh, happened was uh, this comment about kind of like thinking about uh, representatives in the state as somehow having a, at least having an allegiance to a constituency. Right. So there's a sense of the people that they're responsive to a particular kind of people that need to vote for them, support them in some way to maintain their power. <laughs> right. Um, and then there was a moment where um, Patsy Lewis said that well, she was thinking about the ways in which um, people in Gren Grenada were responsive in time of crisis. Of, of, and one of the things that you said at the end was that the things that they were doing needed to be institutionalized, right? Um, and then there was a moment 
from um, Alyssa Trotz, where she was talking about the ways in which, um, like, when you, she was referencing Berlant's piece and, and trying to think about the opportunities that infrastructural collapse presents, right? That, like, you don't have to rebuild exactly the way that it was, but you can imagine a new. And it seems to me that, because I was thinking, I was like, okay, yes, I think that that's absolutely um, brilliant, right, to think about, like, the possibility for change in that way. And I was just also thinking that in order to imagine the possibility of something, there has to be the imaginative conditions amongst the people in order to seize that opportunity. So one of the... so. Thinking about all those things, I'm thinking about like what is happening in the Caribbean with regards to the constitution of a people um, around yeah. sort of like the exercise of political power. And a lot of times we think about political power as being something that's exercised through political elites. But then also when we start talking about the people, we then Put, we think about social movements, we think about unions, we think about people showing up for themselves and taking care of their needs. But how do you think about the people as also like in doing all of that stuff that you might think is important in civil society, the social, whatever, but also sort of actualizing their kind of political power that it seems to be eminently important for what it means to steer the, the state? Or even like, or it seems like it would be eminently important to even reimagine the state so that it were acting in the interest or, or in a, and to even trouble the, the idea of interest or even being steered by the power of people. So I'd love to hear what you, you think about that. Well, let, let me thanks very much, Ensley, for that um, very sweeping but comment, but you brought it down to a question, which, which is what was one of my central concerns, was that in this round of global popular movements, the Anglophone Caribbean has been at one level, in terms of the level of demonstrations and of activity, uh, you know, far off, you know, of place, other places. It's been relatively quiescent. I correct that in light of Gab's comments of movements on the ground, which are not always detectable. And there are also a lots of other things. Esther Figaro will talk about the, the movement for um, against extractivism in Jamaica. The women's movement has been going all the time. There are initiatives in popular culture, which are great. Um, the, you know, the sort of new reggae movement in, 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 in Jamaica. You know, people like Chronics and so on are at the cutting edge of rethinking culture. But having said all of that, um, there is a way in which um, the political system has, has grown to a halt. Um, elections are still held. Um, you know, governments occasionally change. But the, the sort of sense of dynamism within the political, within the state and its political system has, 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 you know, ended a certain history which began in, 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 in the universal adult suffrage back in 1944. This is my assessment at any rate. Um, different, different countries have different paces and different histories, Cuba, for example. But certainly for the Anglophone Caribbean, um, I feel that we are at a certain dead end. Um, the people are not, the people are always doing stuff. Um, they're moving to the United States and um, um, to Brooklyn and to Miami and, um, and living and making a life. Um, uh, or they're moving across the Caribbean to different islands to try and make a living, hustling, doing whatever. But the sense of a project that, was, that involves the state um, is increasingly um, at a dead end. And so, the, the question really, for me at any rate, is um, what replaces it? And what, what sorts of 
I, I don't know, I still think in terms of organization, I still think, think in terms of, of movements. Um, what replaces it? And that nexus is, is, is one that is problematic for me. And maybe it's from where I'm coming. I come from an age of movements and of, of, of insurgent alternative movements. And these insurgent alternative movements are not there. But maybe we don't need movements. Maybe the women's movement is already uh, and has always been active. Um, and, uh, but still, this is a, a frightening and uncertain moment for me. And that's, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I think we have to, you know, take a leaf here from uh, David and uh, raise the issue of temporality. You know, I think all movements go through periods of ups and downs. Uh, when we look at the post-colonial moment in the Caribbean, you know, we're talking 60 years. Look at the post-colonial moment in the United States. It took the United States 121 years to break its dependence on Britain. It's taken Latin America. They're in, what, 200 years? Air revolutions were in 1820? Uh, that sort of stuff. This is not an easy thing to break away from, right? Uh, and we have to... The, that initial optimism that within like 20 years or 40 years after independence, we were going to solve all the national problems. Was a we have to admit that that was a little unrealistic. And uh, to think that we are going to, and this is my big problem with David, that after one try, that we're going to sink in despair. No. Mm -hmm. The United States had a civil war. Hundreds of thousands of people slaughtering each other. Deep crisis of the nation. Did they give up? No. <laughs> Lincoln picked America up, right? So we have to be prepared for deep crises. This, we have to admit now, is a project that is probably going to be centuries old. It's going to take us into the next century to solve all of these problems. So I think the time horizon that we have been working with is a, was a little too unrealistic to think that in 40 years after independence, we were going to solve all of these problems. So let's adjust that. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, thanks, Padgett, for putting optimism back on the table, <laughs> this, despite the title of my book, Ending with Hope. But um, or, 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 or in concurrence with the title of my book, <laughs> Ending with Hope. Um, Patsy, I, you wanted yeah. to come in? I thought that Inslee's question was pointed as well, right? About to me and Alyssa in that sense. And I think Alyssa can answer better than I can. In that, I think that these different, um, and it's not even alternative ways, because that's what people know. That's, that's the experience of how to be, how to live in communities. It's very much there and dominant. I don't think it's marginal. The question is how you bring that to a movement, into a movement to shape and influence ideas that they become the norm in the society. And that's where I would say my, I'm limited. I think it has, you can't expect it from the political elites, there has to be some push. Um, I know that there are all kinds of, of young, young people in organizations who are thinking through these things, like the Marcus Garvey movement in Jamaica. Um, so there are these nas nascent organizations. But I think it requires activism. Something that I'm not comfortable with after the collapse of the Green Day Revolution, I have to be very honest about this, that it's not me, but it has to come from somewhere. And um, <coughs> Alyssa is very much involved in activism, so I think that she can have a far more um, pointed response to, to that. 
Thanks, um, and thanks, Ainsley. That was a beautiful question. I'm not going to speak to the activism because I think it raises all kinds of other questions about the relations between diaspora and mm -hmm. region. But I just wanted to say, uh, you know, a few little words on on politics. Um, a few, you no, know, it was about six years before she died, and I actually was part of a group called Face to Face, which was this group of civil society, that was a language she was very ambivalent about, so I should say that, civil society organizations that were working on questions of constitutional reform and trying to think through the political stalemate, the way in which Westminster politics manifested in a particular, particularly pernicious way in Guyana. And she gave this little three minute interview that you can actually find on the website we built in honor of her after she died, which is really beautiful because in it she says the problem is with the way in which we conceptualize politics and the way in which we have allowed in the Caribbean politics to become captured by the language of power, taking power, politics to become captured by the language of the party, politics to become captured by the language of the state. It wasn't to say the state isn't important, but it was about what it was about thinking through what are the various ways in which people have been organizing, um, you know, because of a particular situation again right now which I won't go into one of the things that I realized and I, I think I'm I, I'm not sure if I'm 100% right but you know it struck me that um, uh, non-governmental organizations are organized in law under something called you know um, um, friendly society and you can only understand friendly societies if you go back to kind of mutual aid and other kinds of cooperative arrangements that enslaved Africans developed um, in and after in during slavery and after so in other words, I think what Andai was talking about, were, what were all of those dynamic, vital spaces of communion, of congregation, those spaces of care and love and relationality? It's not even about what democracy looks like. What does democracy feel like? And what she was saying is that multiplying those spaces, connecting them up against region, <laughs> connecting them up internationally where, inter where national is not about state, is a way of thinking about how we transform state structures. And the last little story I want to leave you with is the story of, I'm glad you came back to 53, um, Erin. I think a lot could be said there. And I also think actually that we talk about betrayal and the collapse of the left after Grenada. But the 1960s in Guyana was also this moment of incredible regional optimism where a lot of the left came to Guyana. Mm -hmm. So we might think that Guyana in the 60s was actually the antecedent to Grenada in the 1980s. But in 1953, the story is often narrated that this multiracial movement collapsed. Well, folks like Ayusi Koyana and others actually tell a different story. And the story they tell is that they knew that the PPP was going to take all of their seats. They knew the PPP would sweep. So energized and excited was the population in relation to an anti-colonial politics. And that some of those in the PPP, Martin Carter, Rory Westmus, um, AUC Quayana, I know Vikram is in the audience and knows a lot more about this than me, advised the political leaders at the time, both of the big political leaders, you are going to win. We are working in communities. AUC was in Buxton. Our heirs are to the ground. You're going to win. Do not go for all of the seats. The strategy should not be capturing state power in this very tenuous moment. Go for a few seats, win them, and go back and start organizing. That advice was never taken, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, we're approaching the end of our little chat. Yes, please um, um, identify yourself. Hi, um, I'm Camila. I am a first year student. I'm studying IAPA and Latin American studies. And Caribbean studies. I'm in Patsy's class, so I'm required to ask a question. <laughs> but um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is now that you're talking about like decentering politics from the state, um, as <laughs> this is gonna be interesting, as a local, um, I think sometimes people perceive the state as the enemy, or like the state as the one in power. Um, but specifically with the Caribbean, I think um, in, as a center that is like focused on tourism and like um, mineral extractivism and all of these things, sometimes the enemy in like 
how do you call these? Quotes? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily the state, but these like stateless companies mm -hmm. that people sometimes don't even see. Um, so if we're talking about like forming movements against these um, very like invisible corporations, how do you do that? <laughs> Um, and the second question is also like regarding like the confirmation of these movements or like moving forward. Um, how do you like create these social movements without fear? And you talked about like care culture coming from like natural disasters or like this like immediate reactions that come from the tragic. Is there a way to like create those bonds without that element? Um, or is fear needed? Um, <laughs> to like fuel those movements and how does like Caribbean culture can be a fuel for those. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's three questions. <laughs> <Sorry>. um, <laughs> movements, fear. I, I, I had my quota for the class. Movements, fear, and culture. Um, <laughs> would anybody want to, to take them up? All right, let me, let me respond to the corporations. I think that, use a, use a mic. oh, uh, we have been dealing with how to uh, control and limit the power of multinational corporations a long time in the Caribbean. We have not been successful, but the point is there's a history of struggle around that. I think in this moment, we are in a new era and there are again, new possibilities. And these new possibilities to me, uh, you know, are, are around uh, Chinese, foreign investment in the Caribbean. Now, I think we are making a big mistake how we negotiate with China. We have to, what made China different? Now, when the US went into China, you know, the idea, if you, I was at the Council on Foreign Relations where they were talking about the Latin Americanization of China and Eastern Europe right after the Soviet Union fell. Well, China has not been Latin Americanized. Something different has come out of all of this Western investment in China. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna suggest that it has everything to do with the fact that China was able to successfully negotiate this partnership model Rather than foreign companies coming in, right, they have a monopoly on profit making and ex repatriating of profits and all of that. China was able to negotiate, right, profit sharing, partnerships. And I think this is why China made more money out of Western investment in China than the West. This is a lesson, I think, for all of us. And uh, so, what are we doing now when China comes to invest? We negotiate with China the way in which we negotiate with Western companies. We don't say, well, you know, in China, you guys had this partnership thing. We want the partnership thing, right? And I think that in the Caribbean, we need to identify at least 100 companies that we could say to the Chinese when they come, look, if you partner with these guys, you will make the money you want. But at the same time, we are going to make some money. We, if we use the same model of foreign investment that we do with Western companies, I mean, look at the uh, Velasco regime in Peru. They tried the partnership thing. What happened to Velasco? He was murdered, <laughs> okay? So it, it, when the Chinese succeeded in doing this, they broke a very, very powerful norm in the world of foreign, foreign investment. And I think that the best way we can now push that norm further is by saying to the Chinese, this is the way we want to invest. And if we get them to come into the Caribbean in that way, and when the Americans and the Canadians and the Europeans come, you say, hey, that's the old way. This is the new way. You know, we have to make moves like that. 
right? Because to me, this is what the Chinese did that was different. And that's why they're not Latin Americanized, quote unquote, the way we have been Latin Americanized and Eastern Europe has been Latin Americanized. So to me, that's how I'm thinking about the corporate thing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there, there, there was a question on, on the culture, right? And I, I, I think that that's a question ripe to consider. Um, I, I think, the, you know, one of the strengths of the Caribbean region, even in these very difficult times, has been the buoyancy of its culture. It's bo the buoyancy of its culture locally and internationally. And, um, you know, the culture is also a reflection of the times we're in. So a lot of it is, is you know, dance music, for example, but, but um, not particularly politically combative in the old style. But there's a lot of it which is addressing um, current social questions in, in very sharp and decisive ways. So it's, 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 it's a reflection of the moment we're in, but there are currents. And I think, um, you know, that is it, that, that popular culture can be a very critical um, element in um, the building of a new society. But it can also just be nothing, or it, it can be a negative element as well. And I, I just think that putting it on the agenda is an important area for consideration, mm -hmm. as you have done. Um, we don't have a lot of time. And part of the experiment of this panel was how are, how many of us, I, I haven't done a count, eight, seven, um, how are we going to have a, a serious discussion in, in, you know, in, in two hours with this huge crowd? Uh, but what I was determined to do was to not waste the book launch. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, Brian has written a good book or a bad book, but for us to move beyond it into the realm of talking about where does the Caribbean go? Because that, that's what I, I try to do in a small way, but colleagues have, and friends have, are here. And I'm really getting this group of people in this room is in itself a victory. Because it's, it's a quite remarkable group of Caribbeans um, thinkers, activists, scholars, um, and it's not often that we, we get together, and um, it's really good to have them here. Um, I'm going to give anyone or everyone, you know, a 30-second, one-minute intervention if they wish. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to, but you know everybody a little intervention, a lot, you know, to, to really wrap up the conversation we've been having in your own way. So, Aaron, can I begin with you? Certainly, um, and I, I just want to say uh, to Brian that I think that we all feel in your debt because I've had a couple of these type of conversations over the years, but this has really been one of the most remarkable and fruitful and rich ones. So, um, but yeah, so I think that. We all are so glad that you have written uh, the book you did, which has managed to bring us all together for this kind of conversation. And uh, we're very happy to be here and to be able to participate in it. Thank you. Thanks, Ira. Padgett, I don't want to say anything. Sure, OK. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd just like to just reiterate, uh, we've got to get back to working class organizing. Uh, we've got to think about unionization on a global scale, the globalizing of uh, union activities. Uh, I want us to investigate and find out what the AFL-CIO is doing with this uh, you know, Institute of Worker Technology uh, around digital, uh, um, you know, 3D printing. Because if indeed we let capital control the technology of 3D printing, the worker implications of it will never be developed. So that's why I thought, I, mean, I, wish, I really wish I could remember her name. But anyway, trust me, she's the, the president of AFL-CIO, and this is her idea. I, I just don't understand why we are all not backing her on this. It's a brilliant idea. Because uh, 3D printing has the capacity Think about it, to bring the means of production back to workers. Remember, this is the revolution that gave us capitalism, right? Uh, they control the means of production. All you had to do was sell your labor. 
This technology, if developed right, would be the first major reversing of that. So I just think that it, it has potential. I don't know, but it's certainly something we should be, you know, thinking about. Okay. So those are Thank some you. of my ideas. <coughs> yeah, I just want to end on a, just a quick note of, uh, you know, despair and atomization versus connection and care. Um, and uh, I, how much I want to thank you for inviting me to come and talk about this book um, and even just experience the process of, you know, learning more about your life, learning more about your own, like, you know, past as, like how you're stitching together your past as a poet, uh, revolutionary, and of course, like, you know, long history as a, as a thinker, as one of the critical thinkers of now. Um, you know, after like the atomization and like, you know, uh, uh, sort of isolation of, of COVID, um, it's been, and, and there's been a, really, for me anyway, like, a, and I think a lot of us intellectually, a much longer period of uh, sort of lingering um, isolation beyond the physical isolation of the earlier moment of, of COVID. And so I, I just thank you for convening us all together um, so that we can share not just in like what, we, what we've been thinking about, but share in like this, this fundamental issue of like, how do we move forward? Um, and so I thank all y'all for being here, um, and thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Danny. Patsy. Thanks. I'm going to use my few words to emphasize the importance of regional solidarity. Grenada cannot negotiate with China on its own. As a matter of fact, China set out a development plan for Grenada. Oh. Okay? Mm. So we're there for capture. We're right for capture. Regional solidarity. Um, I just wanted to just quickly comment on Camilla's um, question. Hurricanes and disasters lay bare what is already there. So these things are always there, but that's when they become visible. And the question is how to harness them to provide an alternative to the capitalization of relationships. And I think that's where I'm going. And I just want to say, in terms of Brand's book, which, which is what brought us here, and I haven't commented on your book, I know that. I think that it would have been great if we could have had a discussion on democracy and how to democratize those societies and to what end. And to, to talk more about the notion of constituent assemblies and how that could work not just in Jamaica, but across the region, and not just how to build a national project that is inclusive, but how to build a regional project that's inclusive. Thank you. Um, Alyssa, you're next, if you want. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna just say thank you. I, um, this was really a wonderful privilege. I really enjoyed hearing from everyone, and Danny, you, you know, left me thinking about Bad Bunny few nights ago, you know, he did this documentary but, but drawing, <laughs> drawing on his international sort of reputation, but he did a documentary on housing, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Puerto Rico, and it just made me think back to when all of the yeah. folks were on the streets, and they pulled tables up and chairs up, and they were cooking outside, and they were having these collective conversations. That's the kind of energy that I think we can build on. But I just wanted to end by saying, Brian, you know, Lamming talks about the sovereignty of the imagination. And I just wanted to pay tribute to you for the decades I've known you as one of the political theorists who crosses genres. You're not afraid to be vulnerable um, through your poetic love, through the literary work you do. I wish we'd had a moment to talk about why you felt the need to language or break the silence about the, you know, what we might call a civil war in Jamaica in 1980, why you had to turn to the novel form in order to tell that, that story. But what you demonstrate there is a genuine care for the capacity of language, for the capacity of the, you know, the artistic endeavor. Um, that is the part that, as Francio said, is sacred and most sovereign because it is completely in, in relation. And I just wanted to thank you because there's so few political theorists um, like yourself who is willing to take those risks and cross those boundaries. And for that gift, we should all be grateful. Thanks, Alyssa. And I, I really didn't want this to be a sort of Brian, thank you session <laughs> no, no, as like much Brian as looking like forward. That. But I, I really do appreciate it in my heart. Francio. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that, that Alyssa just said. It's uh, <laughs> powerful. I could never, I could never top that. Um, let me just end by saying, I wonder if after the tragic sensibility, one does not need a comic sensibility. Mm. I wonder if comedy is not where we're supposed to go, to think that more not fully, to actually think beyond capitalism, a laughter that unshackles. 
I wonder if that is not necessary and needed right now. Absolutely. I agree with that. <laughs> the comic <laughs> sensibility. Um, under the laugh is a blade, always a blade. He said yes, that's that's he laughs, and under the laugh is always a blade. So I think Francis is on to something. I think so. Gab, you're up last again. Gab has left. Gab, Gab, Gab uh, I, um, oh. I'm going to leave. Can you hear me, everyone? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. yes. All right. So I, my camera's off because I'm in the car because I'm about to go and tackle these women parliamentarians who are apparently gathering because the Minister of Education won't approve my integration of gender-based violence into the health and family life curriculum. Wow. So I am damn well going and go and talk to everybody else. Good so that's where I am. And um, I put on a jacket just because, you know, it's a mask dealing with elites. Um, <laughs> and I also want to really honor, I, I really enjoyed your chapter uh, where you reflected on your poetry and I thought that was really beautiful because there are so many poets in the Caribbean who are also activists, mm -hmm. who are also thinkers and writers. And I really love that you took the moment to, um, to use your poetry to look back on, on how you were thinking about the region and what was happening to it and in different stages and, and to show a sense of connection and a sense of emotion about that. Um, and also, of course, to, to again say how much I enjoyed the writing because I felt that there were there were particular chapters that could, I could make accessible to anybody, and it would um, spark them to add, to take those questions on for themselves. And my final thoughts in terms of the future of the Caribbean are wherever it is that we see the world being created that uh, we feel should be the Caribbean future, however small, I think our role can simply be to amplify, 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 wherever, wherever it is, mm -hmm. that is, to use Alyssa's phrase, making itself manifest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I think that's such a great ending. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, memory, imagination, hope, Amplify, amplify, amplify. Thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for the <laughs> participants? I, I, I really, I, I really want to thank my remarkable students in our Africana um, senior class for staying here. I'm sure that Patsy would wish me to thank her students who have also <laughs> lived through this. And let's give them all a round of applause.